this is what we'll be talking about. So first we'll talk about uh, rickets um, and as a clinical uh, problem, uh, you uh, how you're going to approach a child with rickets um, in the ward setting and in the, the clinic setup. Then uh, we got exam point of view. We'll be talking about uh, rickets in the in the short case and as a long case. And in the theory section, <clears throat> it might turn up uh, in the data paper. This is what we'll be talking about. Right. right. First, um, rickets as a clinical problem. Uh, so you might see patients of this nature. So as an example, I've said, okay, this patient, I have seen a one-year-old boy brought for further evolution of difficulty walking and failure to try. And now uh, see uh, Harrison Sarkas and query swollen wrist joints. So we all know it's a, a feature of rickets. Okay? So you suspect uh, uh, very well, so it could be rickets. And now, how I going to evaluate this child further and manage? Okay. This is a common uh, clinical scenario we all encounter. So before going into uh, how we're going to do that, so let me uh, tell you a few things about uh, records. So as you know, records is a deficient mineralization at the growth plate, so it can occur only in growing children. Then. Along with rickets, the other term go hand in hand is osteomalacia, which is impaired mineralization of the bone matrix. So, in in a body, you can have rickets and osteomalacia occurring in the same patient, but obviously, in a in a grown up, you can see only osteomalacia. Then uh, vitamin D, as you all know, play the major role in rickets. Just to remind you of vitamin D metabolism, so you all know uh, the, the main uh, source of vitamin D in our setup is uh, the, uh, due to sunlight. So, when uh, UV rays uh, acting on uh, dehydrocholesterol in the skin, uh, we form polycalciferol, that is vitamin D3, and to that pool, there is the addition yes, you with D3 and also with D2, we'll be talking about in the wild. With the liver, there is 25 hydroxylation of this polycalciferol, and you form 25 hydroxy vitamin D. So, which enters the kidney, and there's one alpha hydroxylation to cause 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. So, this is the most active form of vitamin D hormone. So I'm sure you remember this. So we have uh, the uh, metaphysis and epiphysis and the diaphysis. And in the metaphysical area, you have the epiphysial growth plate, which uh, is the most important place we are talking about. So we we'll talk about a little bit of uh, vitamin D. We all know uh, sunlight is the most important source. But in the dark skin like ours, and also especially in hobbies, we are there's the, uh, the fat skin makes less vitamin D compared to those without a fat skin. And uh, the most important sources are dietary sources are fish, liver oil, fatty fish, and egg yolk. The four sources are breast milk and cow milk. And if we talk about different types of vitamin D we should know about. The vitamin D3 is a common type, it's called cholecalciferol, which is produced by the skin. Okay. And foods of animal origin that we talked about, including the liver, again produce and uh, provides vitamin D3, that is cholecalciferol. Ergocalciferol, which comes from uh, plant foods, is mainly from mushroom. Okay. And uh, when uh, vitamin D is added or into fortified, then it's vitamin D2, not D3, because D2 is, uh, is cheaper to produce. Okay. But when compared to vitamin D2 with vitamin D3, <coughs> uh, calciferol is less amount of calciferol than, than cholecalciferol. The other type of, types of vitamin D that we should be uh, clear about is 25 hydroxy 
calciferol or 25 hydroxyfolic calciferol. Okay, they go to the same. Okay. Then, uh, as a pharmacological management, we use alpha calcidol, which is 1 hydroxycholicalciferol. Then you have calcitriol, which is 125 dihydroxycholicalciferol. So I'm sure you all know this and you should be very clear about. Then for the bone mineralization, you need optimum levels of calcium phosphate in the bone. Okay. And this is maintained by 1.8CC, that is calcium ETH and fibroblast growth factor 23, that is FGF 23, which is produced by osteocytes, okay, which inhibits the <coughs> synthesis of 1.5DHCC. Okay. And, um, <coughs> and it's also caused phosphate excretion from the kidneys. So there is a uh, nice homeostasis of this PTH, 125-DHCC and FGF23. So as you know, low calcium and also some, to some degree low phosphate uh, produce a stimulus PTH from parathyroid gland, which uh, increases the production of 125-DHCC. Okay? And the FGF23 feedback inhibits the 125-DHCC. Right. Now, going back to our child, we are talking about now this child had some features of rickets. Now, you have to make sure this child has rickets. For that, you have to go by the clinical features, biochemical, and radiological investigations. So, in addition to the clinical features we talked about, depending on the age of the child, you can have different clinical features. So during infancy, you find more non-specific features like irritability, sweating, seizures. You have uh, delayed growth of anterior and frontal bossy. In the old child, you have more bony change like uh, Harrison sulcus, rickettrosity, genital valve, and also waddling gait. In adolescent child, child, you might have uh, fractures or seizures, and sometimes you can have unexplained bone pain. And these are the different clinical features and as signs you can look for features from top to bottom okay starting from uh, uh, the head to the toes so, so some pictures of uh, these signs like frontal bossy and also in the head you can you have to look for large head and also a delayed approach of the frontal nose then cricket rosary you have different types of chest deformities in the form of uh, you can have Harrison sulcus, <coughs> pectus carinatum, excavatum, and also pot belly. The widening or the metaphysial area is one of the very common features that we see and we should be looking for. And sometimes this, this could be the only clinical sign that you might come across. Then you have. Uh, you can have lateral bowing or anterior bowing of uh, the shins. You can have knock knees and windshield deformities. You can have pelvic changes in a severely affected children. You can have scoliosis and also kyphosis. So when you have, when you look for this, you might find some of them. Okay, then with these clinical features, as I said, we should suspect records, and now we should. Investigate. Now, I want you to uh, closely follow these uh, investigations, which are very important for you. So, as you all know, the first initial screening uh, investigation that we all do is a biochemical investigation in the form of calcium, phosphate, and alkaline phosphatase. Then, the radiological investigations were the best areas to uh, do the screening is the wrist and the knee. Okay? Then other investigations are important are the Leo function test and the renal function test along with the blood gas analysis. Now we have facilities for 25 hydroxy vitamin D, which is the, uh, the best type of uh, investigations to check for the vitamin D status of the body and also parathyroid home pH levels. So these are the important initial investigations that we should be doing. Okay. So with those, you can. Uh, differentiate 
the main two types of rickets that you all know you all know that is calcipenic rickets and phosphophenic rickets so and calcipenic rickets as you know occur due to inadequate calcium in the bones okay and mostly due to and uh, low availability or defective functioning of vitamin d the phosphorylphenic rickets is due to excessive loss of phosphates and you have phosphopenia so we are called these are two types calcipenic rickets and phosphopenic rickets so to differentiate uh, these two you can make use of the alkane phosphate which is quite high in calcipenic rickets compared to marginally elevated uh, alkane phosphate in phosphopenic rickets and P pth is markedly elevated in calcipenic rickets but normal low slightly elevated in phosphopenic rickets in addition to that in phosphopenic rickets you can figure out there is low phosphates uh, levels in the serum as a radical features you all know that up in serum and osteopenia okay so those are the kaladi shiliye margin Yeah. Can you all uh, switch off your microphones? Uh, your microphones, please. You are disturbed by this. Can all of you switch off, switch off your microphones, please? Thank you. Right. Then in calcipenic crickets, you have low or normal calcium, normal phosphate, and very high alkane phosphate and high pH. And when you have calcipenic crickets. the common three types of rickets are nutritional which is the commonest type of uh, rickets that you encounter then vitamin d dependent rickets type 1 and vitamin d dependent rickets type 2 so those are the three main types of calcipenic rickets okay nutritional then type 1 and type 2 type 2 vitamin d dependent rickets okay so in addition to that you also have renal rickets and distal renal tubular acidosis the when it comes to phosphonic rickets so commonly what you see is a hereditary hypophosphatic rickets which is x linked type so autosomal dominant and recessive types also are there but is a less common and also you can see this scenario in proximal renal tubular acidosis as well so to differentiate the different types or sub types you might have to do plasma 125 dhcc in uric calcium phosphate and to find out uric calcium ferrin ratio and phosphate in urine and tubular absorption of phosphate we'll talk about this and their place in a while right now we'll go into a little bit more detail of calcipenic crickets so we know how to diagnose calcipenic rickets now okay so when you have a child fulfilling the features of calcipenic rickets okay your first thing for is a nutritional rickets okay so you get nutritional rickets mainly due to so it's made so usually due to a, a mixture of inadequate exposure to sunlight and due to inadequate intake so when you have a child with calcipenic rickets we first assume that it is um, uh, nutritional rickets and start the patient on cholecalciferol and calcium okay and you start commonly these patients are usually 6 months to 12 years right so you start them on 6000 units a day younger child you start them on 3000 and a bigger child you start them on 10000 units a day of cholecalciferol okay in addition to that you have to add calcium in a suitable dose which is usually in the range of 30 to 70 per kg right then after one to two months of treatment you repeat the x-ray to look for the line of healing and also you repeat the calcium and alkane phosphatase you should see a downward trend of alkane phosphatase which was Quite high at the beginning. To see that, now you can see it has to be nutritional record, which is the common type of records that you see. So those patients 
after initial high dose of vitamin D, you put them on maintenance dose of vitamin D and you continue for four to three months. Okay, at, at a dose of 400 to 600 units a day. If the response of uh, alkaline phosphatase decline is not there, okay, for the line of healing, it's not seen the X-ray, then you have to think of other types of calcifenic triggers, and it's more likely to be due to vitamin D dependent triggers type 1 or 2. To differentiate, you need to perform 125 DHCC and you have to recheck the 25 hydrox vitamin D levels you have initially set. So, with that, with those, you can differentiate whether it's a type 1 or type 2 types of records. So, vitamin D dependent right because type 1 it, it occurs due to mutations in the gene encoding renal 1 alpha hydroxylase. Okay. So, with that, really you have less amount of 125 DHCC. And these patients present the first, usually first year of life, or maybe up to first two years. So these patients will have normal 25 D hydroxy, 25 hydroxy vitamin D, but low levels of 125 hydroxy vitamin D. And now figure out how that happens. These patients you treat with obviously because there's low levels of 125 DHCC with the most active form of vitamin D, you have to replace with calcium triol and oral calcium. You should be very careful when you treat these patients because if you over treat, okay, you might have hypercalciuria and which leads to um, nephrocalcinosis. Okay. So, because of that reason, you try to maintain low normal serum calcium level the normal serum phosphate level and high normal serum PTH level. Okay. With that, you prevent them from having nephrocalcinosis. And usually, there's, you can see a line of healing in about two months. And these patients, again, has to be monitored uh, closely with regular calcium, phosphate, phosphate and creatinine so that you don't have uh, increase uh, calcium excretion in urine. And you have a target of uric calcium of less than 4 mg or so kg a day. Okay? And routine you have to do ultrasound scan or KUB to detect early nephrocalcinosis so you treat accordingly. Vitamin D dependent because type 2 is less common and there is a mutation in the vitamin D receptor. Okay, so because of that, the poor response of this receptor, there's more and more elevation of 125 hydroxy vitamin D. Okay, so when you do 125 DCC levels, you see they are very, very high. And these patients usually present during infancy. So some of them have less severe form more severe form is generally associated with alopecia and dental abnormalities. The less severe disease where there is a you know, partial uh, activity of uh, the vitamin D receptor, you have less severe affection. Okay, so this is vitamin D dependent because type 2, which occurs due to uh, mutation in the vitamin D receptor. And the treatment of these patients, you know, can be quite difficult. Okay. Some of these patients respond to high doses of vitamin D okay, because of the, uh, the receptors are not completely dysfunctional. Okay. So you can have an effect with high doses of vitamin D. So all of these patients, once diagnosed, should be given three to six months of very high doses of vitamin D. So those who are refracted to high dose vitamin D, you have to, you have to give intravenous calcium, and once you get a, uh, some control, to start change into oral calcium supplements. That is vitamin D dependent type two. 
there will be all no uh, about renal recurs so occurs due to renal osteodystrophy in chronic renal disease and the characteristic features are the high phosphate and high creatinine so the glomerular damage and they are you will know poor conversion of vitamin D to 125 BCG and the treatment is with low phosphate diet and diet with phosphate binders and one alpha calcitol I'm not going to go into detail about this which is a separate topic altogether All right now we'll talk about phosphopenic crickets the common D is due to X-linked hypophosphatemic trigger. You all know about it. And it occurs due to mutations in the phosphate regulating gene in the X chromosome. Okay. And it affects the inactivation of SGF23. Now you remember the function of FGF23. So there's a continuous uh, elevated uh, levels of FGF23 in which leads to low levels of 125 DSCs because FGF23 is supposed to have a feedback inhibition of uh, 125 DSCC. There's an elevation of FGF23 in this condition, which leads to very low levels of 125 DSCC and phosphaturia. And these patients usually manifest in the first two years of life. If they uh, typically have uh, low limb changes in moving and disproportionate short stature you also can have endosopathy and also dental defects so these patients can have uh, severe dental abnormalities and you, have, you can have abscesses and you can have facial cellulitis which can be a uh, presenting feature of these patients that is it's linked to triggers the treatment of these patients, as you can figure out, has to be with oral administration of phosphates. Okay. And usual dose is 20 to 60 milligram per kg a day, and along with high dose calcitriol, because these patients, as you have heard, have low levels of 125 dHCs calcitriol. And also, you can use alpha calcitriol as well. So, uh, you should not give only calcitriol because that leads to hypercalcemia and hypercalciuria, leading to nephrocalcinosis. And you should not give only phosphate because it increases the risk of hypoparathyroidism and, uh, and high phosphate levels. So it should be a combination of calcitriol and phosphates. And there's a new treatment of uh, furosumab, which is a monoclonal antibody, which blocks the FGF23, which is the, the primary cause for this condition. And also, it's very important to have good oral hygiene, dental hygiene. And also, these patients should be closely monitored with serum phosphate, calcium, creatine, alkyl phosphate, and PTA. And also, uh, the buoy, usually with their present, have to be closely monitored. And good postgenital response, and you might need to get the opinion of orthopedic surgeons early. We need regular ultrasound scan and imaging for nephrocalcium. So, summarize uh, these different types of so calcium triggers and phosphatinic triggers. So, I want you to uh, uh, have a good idea about this. Uh, table and you can make your own table so that you know what the different biochemical abnormalities that you should be countering with these patients. So vitamin D deficiency you can imagine. So this should be vitamin uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D, which is a, the best uh, indicator of vitamin D status is low. And vitamin D different type 1 can imagine we have typically low levels of 125 DCC, which is very high in type 2. Okay. And phosphatidic triggers, the first thing is you go by the phosphorus level, which is typically low. And then uh, differentiation of X-linked uh, autosomal dominant and autosomal resistant ones are with uh, gene testing. Right. 
So now let's move on uh, to Ricketts as a short case. So it's a, not an uncommon case in the miscellaneous case in your part two. So typical uh, uh, thing is, okay, you might have a, so we'll, uh, just think about a three-year-old boy brought in old legs noted by the parent. Please examine and let me know the reason for the abnormality. So you know, given a, such a scenario, so most time you might see some features of triggers. So maybe metaphysical widening or you can have bowing or something. So if you find one, it's very important to look for all the possible signs that you look for in regards. Also, look for both failure and asymmetric short stature. You might have um, uh, DDs to exclude, especially metaphysical chondrodysplasia, especially the smidge type, which can be a very mild form, and uh, you might it might mimic previous Africa. Okay, but the usually the Janssen type and uh, Macrosis types, it is uh, no, not usually mistaken for regards. Usually, they have their own other features. And also hypochondroplasia, you know, especially with the, with the exam stress, you might mistaken uh, for recurrence. And also osteogenesis imperfecta. These are the common types that you might have to uh, differentiate uh, features of recurrence from. So once you get features of recurrence, uh, then important to look for the etiology. So diagnosing recurrence alone is not good enough for you to pass. So it's important to look for the cause, signs to find out the etiology of the patient's records. So it's important that you look for the features of fat soluble vitamin deficiencies, that look for features of uh, chronic renal failure, you have to look for the blood pressure, insulin support, then look for dental abnormalities, alopecia, and frontal bossing, the bone abnormalities in the mother, and also we did not talk about um, uh, prematurity as a cause of records. So uh, you should look for read about uh, prematurity and osteopenia of uh, prematurity. And they also can present with features of records. So you will know the features to look for exprem, like uh, scapocephaly in this page. And I would uh, suggest you to have a, a, a table like this to uh, for different types of uh, records, the clinical features, and of course the biochemical abnormalities as well, so that you are ready to face this support short case. Right. Uh, because as a long case, uh, because alone is not very common uh, uh, as a long case, very unlikely, but it could be a part of a long case. Or you may have very complicated case of precursors, maybe with, uh, with type 2 type of vitamin D dependent precursors, where you find it you know, difficult to manage with multiple problems, they are quite possible. So think about it, and you might see them as a long case as well. Right. Now to the last bit, uh, precursors, the theory component is more likely to appear the daytime interpretation Paper. So I'll give you two uh, uh, data interpretation questions. See if you can answer. Right. An eight-year-old boy is evaluated for short stature and is found to have deforming lower limbs. Okay. And this patient is uh, having serum calcium of 2.2, this upper normal. Serum fossil is very low. Second percentage is you know, the upper limit of normal age, or slightly high. Heat age is high normal, and normal uh, hydroxy with 25 hydroxy D, and 125 hydroxy is quite low. What is the most like diagnosis? I'm sure most of you will figure out. Anybody want to answer? Okay, fine. So it's an excellent hyperphosphatic record. It's very clear, right? So the typical features you have, uh, uh, I have um, 
be uh, with low wanted by uh, DHCC with low phosphate levels. Right? So, what are the other clinical features to look for? So, you should know other features of uh, hypophosphatemic triggers. Right? Then, how do you treat? You know, it's a calcium triode with phosphorus supplementation. And now, you should be very clear about it. Then, you know how to monitor. Then, so which investigation is most useful to detect idea response? The PDA. It should be PDA should be kept at normal levels. Right. Number two, an eight-year-old boy is evaluated for short stature is and is found to have deformed lower limbs, and this patient is found to have uh, higher levels of uh, serum calcium, very low phosphate levels. Acrophosphate is high normal. PTH is on the low normal, and 25 hydroxyvitamin D level is normal, and 125 D is high. What are we dealing with here? I will need time to go through this again. Now, to carefully look for this uh, uh, case scenario, or the, you have a phosphophenic type of records. You all should be very clear about. And the catch here is the 125 DHCC is not low, which should you should you, uh, which you, uh, you, you should expect in uh, this uh, hypophosphatemic type of records. This is X linked or autosomal dominant or recessive. So it's not, we are not dealing with any of them. So this is a typical scenario of a healthy hypothetic with hypercalciuria. So what are the clinical features to look for in this child? So these patients have muscle weakness, bone pain, and loin tenderness. So I'm, I want you to read about this condition and uh, additional investigations. Uh, renal phosphate and calcium excretion, ultrasound scan, AUB. Then how do you treat? So here you do not give calcitriol because in these patients is the calcitriol is high. So you replace only phosphorus and you monitor with serum calcium, phosphate, acid phosphate and ultrasound scan. Right, so with that, we'll conclude and uh, to uh, take home messages. So, triggers is a very common clinical problem, it's a very it's a chronic problem, and you cannot uh, say, I do not know about it, is a common clinical problem for a you know, pediatric um, uh, doctor. It is likely to be encountered a short case and a data interpretation that we discussed. And the commonest type of recurs is nutritional. And you should know the DDs for uh, the recurs, that is metaphysical chondrodysplasia, which is mainly Schmidt type, then hypochondroplasia, which can be uh, tricky to differentiate sometimes. And diagnosis is uh, made clinical with the biochemical and radiological investigations, and you need uh, the investigation that we talked about to differentiate different types of triggers and the management varies according to the type of triggers and which we discussed. Right, so with that, we'll conclude lecture and thank you very much.